Let's get um, French Almighty. French Almighty. All right. What's up, French? Yeah, Terry. What's up, brother? What's up, French? How are you? You know, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'm I'm uh, from racist Twitter, and I just wanted to tell you. Um, you from where? 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 You from where? I'm, I'm from racist from Frog Twitter, from racist Twitter, and oh, okay, uh, so I, I just I just want to pay you the compliment. Um, oh, the guys on a slow down. All right, slow the f down. I hate when y'all white supremacists jump on and y'all just get to talking. And, uh, slow, <laughs> oh. down. slow down, man. Well, was oh. I going to for you, buddy? Slow down, slow down. Because sound like you're about to do some, get into some goofy trolling or something. No, no, down. no. I actually wasn't going to do okay. that. I okay, was, uh, I was, I was going to pay you a comment. That's all I got to say. Oh, all right, um, all right, which is down. that uh, the, the guys on uh, on right wing frog Twitter, they, they they call you Socrates because you're so good at interrogating people that you actually. Okay, and this is why I can tell you're trying to get your little trolling off, and you're trying to talk over me so you can quickly get your, your to to say your little n word. All right, that that's not a that doesn't bother me, sir. White supremacists using the the n word that no, doesn't no bother no me. no. It was a compliment. Uh, you know the Craig okay. method, right? It doesn't bother me, sir. That's what I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to slur you. What I was trying to explain that doesn't is bother that, any of us, sir. Using the n word doesn't bother. No, me. What, 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 I, what, I was, us, what I was what I was what I was trying what to what bothers us is wet dog smell mixed with mayonnaise. That's the thing that bothers us, sir. That's more offensive than the n word. That wet dog smell. That's why. You should go to rootworkstyle.com and get some rootwork deodorant so you can get that wet dog mayonnaise smell off your ass. Okay? <laughs> That's what you need. Sir. <laughs> Why are you trying to figure out ways to yell nigga? Nigga use some deodorant. No, no, that's not what I was trying to do. What, okay. I, what I was trying to say is you know, you know the Socratic method, right? Like you use it all the time. It's like a, I use what? We use um, what? The, the Socratic method, the, a mechanism of philosophical inter interrogation whereby one questions one's uh, opponent in debate such that you more or less like uh, manipulate them in, into uh, a this, this, this this is white supremacist babble let me ask you this how do you feel about OJ man shit let's get to the, the nitty gritty uh, OJ Simpson was he innocent or guilty uh, he was guilty but he should have been acquitted okay now why do you think he was guilty uh, I mean I mean th th this is so overwhelming it's, it's, it's obvious but I think he should have been acquitted obvious how obvious how uh, DNA evidence, etc. But I will say this: you, no, no, I no, do no, think you, no, 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 no. You mean the evidence that your white supremacist brethren planted? Your, your, your. I think your. Let me finish uh, my perspective, and I think you'll actually appreciate it. Okay, I, I, be it. I believe that O'Shea should have been acquitted because I believe the LAPD framed racistly a guilty man. He definitely killed Nicole and Ron Goldman, but also huh. the LAPD framed him. Right. Okay. Now they, you've admitted that he framed him. Now. How did he kill her? Because him killing her makes zero sense logistically and just motive wise. What motive did he have to kill her? Oh, I, I mean, I mean, basically, uh, the biggest one, as far as I know, is he was, uh, is she was sleeping with um, uh, his mentee. Uh, that was the USC graduate, Marcus. Uh, what was his name? Um, Marcus. Al yeah, 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 yeah. She, she, she was fucking his, uh, his mentee and best friend, and that, and that really hurt him. And so he was, Not really, he, was really, he was really pissed after about that. after after she banged Marcus Allen, he let Marcus Allen get married in his house. So he wasn't tripping on that. He knew his wife was a slut. She was banging everybody. So he knew that he wasn't tripping on her. Yeah, I, I think I think, though, um, he had also witnessed like some 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 Polish guy who was like a restaurateur. Actually, I think owned Mezzalina. Um, the like, yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. Uh, Zlom, Zlom check or something. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he had, he had, yeah, yeah, he had watched her like suck his dick, through, part of my language, uh, like through the window of the of, um, Gretna Green house. And uh, there was something that he was really mad about, which was not actually the blowjob. It was the fact that the kids were upstairs. And That's I right. think I think that the real reason at the end of the day. OJ, that, OJ, years, that had happened years before the murder. So, oh, is that? I, I thought it was more recent than that. But, but my impression was that the reason OJ got so royally pissed off that it was driven to a rage of like wanting to kill, wanting to kill Nicole, was because his feeling was not that he, that she was fucking other dudes. Like he knew about that, right? But that she was doing so with his young children upstairs, and he viewed that as disrespecting his kids, and that's why he fucking lashed out. So you're saying he cared so much about his kids. He killed the mother and left her dead body there so the kids can go see it. 
and he got on a plane and left town so his kids could be there by themselves with their dead mother. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think in extreme moments, I, I think, I think, I think in extreme motion, moments of emotion, you know, people, people lose their shit. They, they don't think rationally. Okay. So he got for just woke up one night and right before a flight snap became extremely irrational, but then snapped right back out of it and got rid of all of the murder weapons and the evidence and turned right back to normal and caught his flight on time. Right. I think sometimes, uh, you get really angry. You, you, you freak out. You do something rash, and then um, you know. And then snap, snap right. <clears throat> well, I you know. I, I think. I think afterwards, like like you cool off, you know, real quick, and you're like, "Holy shit, what did I just do?" And if I were to guess, I think that's what happened there. Wow. So he, for no reason, no motive, just sat up there in the room and said, "You know what? That woman was sucking dick. Let me go put on some a sweatsuit and some Bruno Mogli shoes that don't match a sweatsuit and a skull cap, so that." It will disguise me to her because she won't recognize me with this skull cap and some gloves that don't fit. And I'm going to go over here and I got about 25 minutes to kill her and get rid of everything to catch this flight. You thought he did. Okay, that. okay, okay, Tariq. Well, I'm willing to entertain your theories. Like, like, who you actually. That's not a theory. That's, that's literally, that's, that's the timeline. Yeah, no, I, 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 I acknowledge that. They said it was a 25 minute window. To, I, I acknowledge to this, but like, it, okay, so so then, then there's a counterfactual to consider, right? It, like, okay. let's assume O.J. Simpson didn't do it. Who did? Drug dealers. That was a drug hit. She was a coke whore. I hate to be facetious. I hate to be mean. Her, her and her friends were coke whores. They were snipping up everybody's dope. Faye Resnick, her best friend who was staying with her, was in a drug rehab. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this is, snipping... Faye, Faye, Faye Resnick actually wrote a book about this around the time. You're actually, right. Right, you're were, actually right. correct about this. They were snorting up everybody's stuff. They were messing with those people at the Mezzaluna, which was a drug trap house, basically. Other waiters from the Mezzaluna got Yeah, so, so, so do, do you think that Ron Golden's relationship to, to Nicole was as a drug dealer? Who, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I know the Mezzaluna was a place where they were dealing drugs. Other waiters from that restaurant got killed, too. Other friends of theirs got killed, too. That's why they didn't have none of their friends. All of their friends were criminals, sir. They were around very nefarious people. That whole crowd that Nicole and those guys were around were nefarious people. That's what got them killed, the crowd that they were around. Oh, rich black people, millionaire black people don't go around killing people with knives. That don't that would have been the first time in history that happened. A black millionaire killed somebody with a damn knife. And did well, it well, I, one, one thing one, one thing that uh, that that white people have always wondered about um uh is 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 why do black people have loyalty to OG Simpson when he basically like exclusively hung out with white guys, uh very rich white guys no less. And why, very, what, very why, white why, women why, and why, stuff like this. Why, like why, like, like why like when OJ abandoned the black community, like 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 why do black people care so much about OJ's fate? It's not because it's not about OJ. This wasn't about OJ. The white supremacist society was using OJ as a proxy for black people. They were using OJ to get revenge on black people because of the LA riots. They were mad at black people because we gave the city a billion dollar bill because of the LA riots, because of Rodney King. They were gonna use OJ. Um, as a proxy to punish us, to get us upset. Because at that time, in the early 90s, it was very common for people in the white supremacist community to do crimes against other white people and then pin it on black people. 1994, same time as Nicole, they had Susan Smith. I talked about this earlier. It's a white woman who drowned her kids and then lied and said a black man did it. Oh, yeah, Couple yeah. That, that, was, that was in like Texas in like 94 or something, right? Yeah, that was 94. That was in 94, too. Um, early '90s, up there in Boston, Chuck Stewart, white man killed his wife. You, you know, it's it's funny you mention this. Uh, actually, a lot of the jurors, because I, I recently rewatched or actually watched for the first time the ESPN documentary. It's a very long documentary. It's like five hour and a half parts about OJ's entire life. Uh, right. I, think, I think the last two parts you've probably seen it. You know, are are, are kind of centered around the trial. Um, but the jurors in the final episode, you know, towards the end of it, were asked like, you know. Do you think OJ did it? And they they shrugged their shoulders, you know. But from no, their but, for, but, well, well, let me finish. The, from their stop, perspective, stop, stop, it didn't matter. No, 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 no. Stop. You're not being honest. You're not being honest. A lot of you guys, the white supremacists, has been lying about what that documentary showed. It wasn't the jurors. It was one black juror where the interviewer was kind of leading the questions and kind of put words in her mouth and asked the woman, "Was this kind of revenge for?" 
you know, like payback for Rodney King. And she's like, yeah. She didn't say OJ. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. You don't think that's right, representative? Right. No. Because you got other jurors who said, hey, look, we looked at the evidence and, you know, we, we, we broke the evidence down and this is what it was. This is what, what it was. What, what, do you, what do you think about my initial assessment, though, where I, I, I thought OJ was guilty and should have been acquitted for the reason but, the LAPD, of, of LAPD misconduct? He wasn't guilty, though. If he was guilty, they wouldn't have had you, the... Uh, you're, you're, well, yeah, but, yeah, but you're, 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 you're if, breezing over my point. My point is that irrespective of his guilt or innocence, he should have been acquitted because the LAPD broke the fucking law. They, they broke their own fucking rules. And when the cops break their own rules, you got to hold them accountable. Yeah, but if he was guilty, they wouldn't have had to plant all that evidence. So, you, you see, if he was guilty, you know, why it's, would... it's funny. I think he was guilty, but I actually, I, I'm actually thoroughly convinced that most likely Mark Furman did plant that glove. Yeah, of course he did. The gloves didn't fit. The gloves didn't fit at all. It just didn't fit. And Mark Furman, this guy, people downplay this guy's racism. This guy told everybody who would listen. He would just meet strangers and tell them how much he hated niggas. No, it was it was actually kind of crazy, dude. I mean, the, the guy literally tried to get like a early retirement for LAPD because he was right. so scarred from 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 beating up black people in his, in his words, niggers. Right. And he bragged on tape. He bragged on tape about how he planned evidence on black people. He he one hundred percent planted evidence. You don't have to plant evidence on a person who's already guilty. You just get what, the, what, what do you think about the weird rehabilitation of Mark Furman? You know, thirty years after the case, you know, where like he, um, I think he got himself involved in some sort of like Kennedy thing back in like the back in like the two thousand. I don't or know. Fox News, tried, Fox News tried to prop him up. Fox News. So yeah, he's persona non grata. But the thing is, even just the physical evidence, um, you know. And, and just logically, Ron Goldman was a martial artist. This guy had defense wounds all on his knuckles. He was fighting for his life. He was beating the shit out of somebody. O.J. Simpson didn't have any bruises on his body. I just don't believe. Well, he, he did have that cut on his knuckle. The cut on his knuckle came in Chicago. O.J. was on a plane after uh, the murders he was on a plane. People saw him. He was signing autographs. People said he didn't have any bruises on his hand. Nobody saw any cuts on his hand. When he was in Chicago and he was going to fly back to Los Angeles, he was on the phone with a travel agent. The travel agent heard the glass break in the background. So he broke, he cut his finger. Yeah, I, 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 I was wondering about that. He also said that, like, uh, well, another explanation that I heard was that he had heard about Nicole's murder, like, while in the hotel room. And he broke the glass because he was like, you know, holy fuck, like, what just happened? Right. That, that was another explanation. I, I'm not sure which one is, is valid. Right. And, and, and there was a travel agent on the phone who heard the glass break. So, yeah, he cut his. And then when he got back to Los Angeles hours later, he volunteered to do. Hey, like, hey, if you think I'm a suspect, no, no, no. Take my blood. He volunteered his blood. Innocent people don't do that. He went in there with without his lawyers. He said, no, 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 no. I don't need my lawyers. No, no, no. Um, I'll tell you anything you need to know and take my blood so you can exclude me. So, well, well so discounting all white people involved, though, Ron Ship, who was a black LAPD officer, um, basically said... Who was, a, who was a grifter who was trying to come up, but go ahead. Well, no, Ron, Ron, Ron Ship, um, <clears throat> you know, who was a good friend of OJ's, you know... He wasn't a good friend of OJ. That's another <clears throat> lie. Is, is that, that not correct? No, he's not. No, he wasn't a good friend of OJ. He, he tried to pass himself off as a, hey, I was a very good friend of OJ. But he was, no, he was saying all that shit to get book deals and all of that. He wasn't a good friend of OJ. He was, 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 was he fucking Nicole inside too? Because, like, I know. That I don't know. I, I, that I don't know. I don't know. There was a lot of opportunities circling around. But um, OJ volunteered his blood. Guilty people don't do that. He said, hey, just take my blood and look. You can see I didn't do anything. They got that man's blood and took the damn blood to the crime scene by their own admission. Sir. Well, I, I, okay, so I, I'll, I'll I'll grant you this. I, I don't agree that he was innocent, but I do agree that he should have been acquitted, um, on, which is unusual position. That's just not my message. But but I, I do wonder about the later conviction, about the over the Vegas conviction. Like, what's your respect on that? Um, I mean, that's that was revenge. That was revenge. That's a revenge case. That's white supremacist society trying to get back at black people, and it did, and that failed because we didn't care at that point. At that point, we were just kind of done with it, like. Like, OJ, why are you around these white people setting you up? His, his so-called white friends set him up. So we're like, hey, OJ, we're done, brother. So the white supremacist society, they didn't even get the reaction. See, white supremacist society is all about triggering black folks and getting us upset, having us all mad and angry. And it was a big letdown. They did that big Vegas finesse 
Um, it was a bunch of I'm white and I say so. They convicted him, gave him this ridiculous sentence for stealing his own stuff. And black society was like, man. So white white people didn't even get the sadistic satisfaction of getting us upset. So, 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 uh, so Tariq, one final question I'll dip because uh, I know there's a lot of people here. Um, uh, which is that like everyone knew, even even I'm, I'm millennial. I was born, I was actually born in '91, so you know this is all well before my public awareness. But um, everyone knows about the Rodney King beating and the riots thereof. Um, <clears throat> one thing a lot of people in my generation don't really talk about or know about was this uh, was this murder of a of like a 13 year old girl by this Korean store owner uh, for allegedly like pocketing orange juice or something. Uh, and I, I was wondering if you want to highlight that because that is one thing that I think is actually like in a lot of ways like more egregious and unfortunately like less well known probably because it's not on good video uh, compared to the Rodney King beating. Yeah, it's on video. The, the video of Soon Ja Yu, whatever the woman's name is, shooting that girl in there. I think La, Latasha was 15, by the, by the way. But yeah, it's on video where she shot the girl in the back. The thing, the thing is, the video is very low quality, though. It's like black right. and white security footage, you know, compared. Right. And, and so, so yeah, like, this is not right. was This anti-black nonsense. And the white judge it was a white female judge who let the woman go. So it was that type of racial antagonism towards black people. Um, in the court systems, especially in Los Angeles at the time. So, so w- what do you make, though, of, like, the Korean black, you know, kind of like, uh, like strange, you know, kind of intercultural conflicts in, in L.A. in the early 90s? Uh, like, like, do you view that in the in the frame of, like, white supremacy, or do you think that's kind of a different type of, uh, like, species of racism? Well, well, the thing is, they the white supremacists use, you know, many Asian groups as buffers, so they give them certain... Um, privileges over us, which is the ability to harm us with impunity. And, you know, that caused a problem. And what, cause black people were very supportive of the Koreans, the Korean stores. We were the patrons of those stores, the hair salons and the, the hair care places. We were the patrons of those places. So, um, we didn't like that form of disrespect. So yeah, yeah, but during the King rides, though, I mean, I mean, like they're they're like legends of like North Korean, or excuse me, not North Koreans, uh, but like Korean shop owners, you know, like like you know, pulling shotguns on riders and you know, just straight up executing people in the streets and stuff. Yeah, they didn't do anything to black people though. Well, well, yeah, well, 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 who were they shooting then? Oh, no, they were getting at the white Hispanics. Um, for some reason, white supremacists they've been trying to rewrite history. And I talked about this before. There's this weird thing where they're trying to rewrite history like those rooftop Koreans were bringing it to the brothers. Dude, I was at the L.A. riots. I was there in the middle. Those Korean rooftop dudes, they weren't doing anything to black people. They knew better. They weren't do. They didn't harm one black person. And I think they've even done interviews saying that they didn't do anything to black people. They knew that shit would have went real bad for them. So yeah, they didn't harm no black people. So I don't know this real, this weird revisionist history you guys are trying to do um, to try to elevate them. But no, some of those of us who were there, we know the truth. They they weren't doing anything to us. So out so so the Korean shoppers didn't kill any of the black riders. No. Hell no. 100% no. It would have been a, a problem. And the that liquor store where Latasha Harling got shot, the brothers got rid of that shit and got them up out of here too. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Didn't the uh, didn't the Asian Asian uh, woman uh, she, she she only got like probation. She didn't go to jail. Did yeah, she? yeah, yeah. She did she got they let her go and she got the hell up out of there. A few years ago, yeah, the Asians, they they no no no. No, them harming us in LA? You know, let, let, come on, let's let's be real. We got some of the most hardcore gangs in Los Angeles. You think some Asians are going to really bring it to some black folks in LA? Yeah, honestly, I, I don't know. I've, I've never, okay. I've never been. Yeah, the answer is black. no. The answer is no. All right. Uh, about what five, six years ago, there was a situation in Compton where uh, an Asian store owner, I think he punched a black woman. Oh boy. The next day it was on and popping up there. And oh, I, oh, wait, wait, I, I see what you're saying. You're saying uh, that, it was the, on that there's a tendency the very next for the black community in LA to take vigilante justice they had to against. Sell their, they had to sell their shop. It was a, a beauty 
store in Compton, they had to sell it. I'll just put it that way. They had to sell the shopping. Yeah, yeah. Th- there, there's something also like kind of like unusual economic ec- economically about this all, though, right? Like there, there was a there was a weird circumstance that happened in the like you know mid to late '80s and early '90s where essentially like black hair care stores were traditionally like a like you know kind of like a like a black run you know small business in the ghetto, right, or the hood or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and and there was a time where Koreans took this over, and there were actually like Korean manuals, like two or three hundred page, like you know spiraling binders of like directions how to how to run a black hair care business in LA that the Korean community was passing around themselves among themselves and I do wonder like you know did, did, like was there any bitterness in the black community by the fact that Koreans took over like like the black community's like own like kind of uh, industry or whatever like small business kind of co no, it was bitterness it wasn't bitterness but we just understood how white supremacy works how white supremacy created buffer classes and there was a lot of economic deprivation for black people we couldn't get the business loans that a lot of these other groups could get because we got to understand when people immigrate over here, when they flee from these homelands, one thing that people overlook is that these people oftentimes get brand new social security cards and they get a whole new fresh line of credit. So all of their bad credit and debt that they've accumulated, that gets left back in the places they fled from. So they come over here, you get a new ID and a new social security number and a fresh new line of credit, and then you go into the bank and then you get a loan and we can't get that stuff. So you get access oh, 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 to- It's not even limited to this. Um, I actually have a friend that's now a successful startup guy um, who's uh, Korean. And literally, like if you're if you're a fresh out of Korean, like the Korean community has credit pools where they'll they'll give like fresh out of Korean immigrants like basically like interest free loans, uh, just oh, yeah. on on basis of ethnic nepotism essentially. Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah, I think they call it a key. It's a certain name that they call it. Um, yeah, where well, they they have these little pools where they put all their money in, and then they kind of decide who to um, grant the resources to. They kind of pick and choose. So, yeah, they look out for each other, which is good. We, we don't we don't trip on that. Just we don't want no disrespect. And when they try to harm us, then that's a problem. But, yeah, we, as Foundation of Black Americans, we do business with everybody. We welcome everybody. We try to support everybody. We, we're the only group who does that. We we don't have this thing where we discriminate against folks. The other folks discriminate against us. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you say this, dude. Like, you might think, like, white Americans support each other. Like, they don't, okay? Like, you maybe have your family, and that's it. Like, your parents, your siblings, that's about it, dude. Um, however, I will say this. I, I do want to ask I, I don't ask about this since you're in L.A. No, but let me, let me say that. But what you just said, yeah, y'all have a lot of infighting among white society, but the thing is, you all get on code when it comes to dealing with us. Now, when we walk in the room, y'all put all that shit aside, and y'all get on code. But go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You do. <laughs> yes, you do. When well, it, no, no, no. Okay. So, so Tariq, Tariq, you're a you're, you're an elegant. Yeah, even the alt right, even the alt right, those guys, when ain't no black people around, they start bickering with each other. Oh, they start fighting each other. They fall out. Oh, they bicker left and right. When there ain't no black people around to kind of yeah. <laughs> well, Okay, okay. Well, I mean, Richard Spencer is a closet homosexual. Oh, but, uh, right. Y'all, yeah, they hate each other. Richard Spencer, y'all hate Richard Spencer, then Ben Shapiro. Nobody, all, y'all. well, ben, ben Shapiro is an Israeli operative. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like there, there's there's a lot of inter, like intersections. But y'all were and, perfectly fine when he was demonizing <laughs> Trayvon Martin and all of that. Y'all were cool with that. So, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, yeah. in, 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 well, in fairness, like, uh, like, what was his name? Uh, what was it Hernandez or something? Um, uh, well, who's the guy? Who's the guy that murdered Trayvon Martin? Zimmerman. 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 Zimmerman that's who. Zimmerman, Zimmerman, Zimmerman wasn't even white, dude. He was. Uh, he was like. He was white uh, enough. He was white Hispanic, and y'all got on cold with him. He was white enough. I. He was. White- was white enough to get acquitted and supported by white supremacy. So, so I want to I want to ask you something though. Okay, so, so so you're in LA guy. Did you did you grow up in Compton or in like the hoods in LA? I did. I actually did live in Compton. Okay, I so so I, I've seen two movies, both of which I like, but were very different in flavor. Um, about uh, about Compton back in the back in the eighties, um, and early nineties. Uh, one was um, one was Boys in the Hood. Uh, I think it's John Singleton, and the other was um, Menace to Society. And I like neither Menace. one was about Compton though. Oh, well, what were they about? The South Central LA it wasn't about Compton. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I'm yeah. I'm an East Coast guy, so I really don't know uh, the distinction. 
Right. South Central L.A. and Compton are two different things. Compton, to a lot of people who are outside of L.A., Compton has become kind of a caricature for white society. They think Compton is a bunch of black people walking around with sagging pants drinking 40 ounces. Um, Compton is actually a a beautiful city. It's a very deceptive city. You won't even know that you're in the so-called hood. Well, South Central L.A. is aesthetically a beautiful place. The houses are nice. It's not junky. It's relatively clean. The lawns are manicured. You will get your head blown off if you go on the same block messing with somebody and you, you know, you, you get caught up. But it, it's not a dirty, hood-looking place in the traditional sense. So, so that it's a very deceptive place to a lot of people. That's why people get caught up out here. Interesting. Uh, the, the only other the only other media that I've consumed uh, kind of surrounding that that I guess the L.A. kind of uh, is like, you know, kind of like, you know, black or ghetto or whatever you want to call it culture scene is I did read this book. Uh, have you ever heard of Monster Cody? Yeah, yeah. 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 So he wrote an autobiography about his like gang life, I guess, with uh, what was it? The uh, the the, 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 the crypt. Yeah, yeah. 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 What did you think of that book? Like, did that more or less like accurately portray gang life in that in that area, you know, during that period of time? Or, or what did you think? Yeah. Was or what? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Cody was, you know, it was pretty accurate what was going on in the 70s. Yeah. He was um, he's like one of those first generations. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty he, deep. He even knew the founder of the Crips, right? Uh, the guy that guy that was executed Ray- a couple like a decade ago, maybe. Yeah. I think he didn't know Raymond. Yeah. Raymond Washington. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so, you know, all those murders and shit, like all that, all that crazy stuff that was going down in the 80s was actually, and also, and also the other thing he said in that book, um, which I read, you know, probably close to 10 years ago. So it's been a while. Um, but like one of the things that he pointed out was that like, you know, back in the day, dude, like, you know, she would get called in, you know, the LAPD would like send in helicopters back in the eighties, whatever. And like, sometimes they would just like, they would just like execute guys when there was gunfire going off. They would just like shoot people, whether they were armed or not. Like there was no need for basic like rules of engagement or whatever. Like it was straight execution style often. Uh, with the Yeah, they did that a lot. Yeah. But in the seventies, um, that's when they started because of the civil rights movement, the, the white supremacist powers that be needed to counter that. Um, they started flooding black areas, especially L.A., with these psychotropic drugs, LSD, angel dust, um, sherm. They, they really started flooding the neighborhoods with this stuff. So a lot of those guys in the 70s, they were whacked out on sherm and LSD and just a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, a lot of the drugs had to do with a lot of the behavior. Um and, you know, that 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 created a bad situation for everybody. Um, and then, then we know what crack did in the 80s. So this stuff, a lot of these things are introduced to these areas specifically to. Uh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. So in other words, like a lot of the times this like so-called psychotic criminal behavior wasn't a black thing, but it was a drug induced psychosis. Thing. Yeah, a lot of these dudes were sherm the fuck out. A lot of them were on acid a lot of the stuff they were doing was you know they weren't excuse me they were on hardcore psychotropic drugs at the time when a lot of this stuff was going on now um later on it got better when those crazy drugs got out of the mix yeah um but but again a lot of that stuff was introduced and and partially orchestrated by those in the dominant society so we got to put everything in the right context what what do you what do you think about this thing? This has been memeing on my side of Twitter uh, recently. Uh, these like early videos of uh, of Tupac back when he was like a ballerina and like a theater kid and like Baltimore magnet, you know, public arts high school or whatever. Um, and everyone's saying Tupac was gay. Do you think Tupac was a homo? No, no, no. Y'all know why? What is it about white supremacist society where y'all find a black icon and you guys always try to make them gay? Y'all try to do that with Malcolm X. You always try to find a black icon and make them gay. I, I, I don't think I don't think Malcolm. I, actually, actually, I, I've always respected Malcolm X a lot more than Martin Luther King because Malcolm X was like, like, like you know, fucking any means necessary. Like, there's that iconic picture of him, like, you know, with uh, with an AK or whatever, like, you know, peeking out right. and like. But your community, the white supremacist community, you guys are always got to try to moisten up a, a black icon. In a, a black mask. I mean, icon. I mean, dude, I can send you the video, dude. He really seems gay in that video, bro. 
Well, he was a kid doing what ballet or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was doing ballet at uh, Baltimore Performing uh, Arts High School or something. Uh, was a very diverse brother, man. Just you know, he was a very diverse brother. Brother wasn't gay whatsoever, you know. But that, that's a projection because uh, you know, there's a there's a that Greco Roman culture of homosexuality comes from your culture, sir. That's a you know, that's a a big projection. That was a major part of your culture. And even the jokes that you and your, your your culture you guys get into are very homoerotic. Even the lynchings you guys would do was very homoerotic. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, there were, there were no. Hold on, hold on, slow down. Y'all would fight over black penises. All right. Y'all were very homoerotic. All right. Have you seen my movie Buck Breaking? I talked about that. I, in my movie. I, I, I have not seen it. I've, I've heard about it. I should probably, I should probably take the time to watch it. But, um, Go watch but it. I was going to, I was, was going to say though, the, the, like a number of great black artists were like, uh, you know, I, I think of like Michael Jackson or Prince or, whatever. by the way, I, I do want to point out one thing I'm convinced of. I think Michael Jackson was obviously fucking innocent. Uh, I, I, I saw that HBO documentary and then like I read about it afterwards and like, Poor Michael Jackson, after his death, was basically slandered completely unjustly. Michael Jackson was absolutely innocent. Yeah, Michael or Prince, they, none of them, they weren't gay. They weren't gay at all. Well, no, well but did you agree with me though, about Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson's innocence? 100%. Michael Jackson, 100% innocent. 100%. Because uh, I, I saw that HBO documentary uh, that came out a couple years ago, and then like I, I watched this analysis of it where, like, like I forget who it was. It was actually a white guy that broke it down and basically was like, these guys are fucking lying looking for a payday. And, like, he broke down, like, step by step how all of their claims didn't work because, like, right. buildings where they said it should happen didn't exist when they said it happened. Like, I mean, it was like, it was like, it was like they were lying, like, at, at every step of the way. Yeah, yeah they, uh, of course they were lying. And they were like, um, yeah, the the what's that Wade guy? Um, yeah, yeah, we we the 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 Australian kid that like dated Britney Spears and shit. I know you're talking about. Well, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, Rob like, Robson, Robson, that's who it is. Right, 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 right. Like, because I know Michael's niece, Michael Jackson's niece, and I, I, we we've had her on one of my my broadcasts. Didn't before. didn't she date Robson at some point? She did. She did. She dated him, and yeah. So that whole thing about. Um, Rob was like, oh, Michael was jealous that, you know, he didn't, he wanted Rob to himself and, and he dated Michael's niece, you know, Michael introduced him. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, did, was, um, <clears throat> did, Mike, did Michael's niece ever talk, did you ever talk to her about this? Like, did you ever talk to her about Wade Robs and all these like, like, I, I think bullshit claims? Oh yeah. She's real pissed off about it. Yeah. She's extremely pissed off about it. So yeah, you know, it is what it is. Well, no, where's the, the rabbi was up here. I just saw the rabbi. It was a rabbi up here. Wait, wait rabbi, it, 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 was, it wasn't Shmuley, was it? No, man. Where's the rabbi? I got to get the rabbi back up here. All right. All right. Thank you. Let me get let me get some more calls in here. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, the rabbi, yeah, I wanted to talk to the rabbi. I got to get him back up here. All right. Let's get um. Let's get some of these names in here. Let's get Ghetto Mayor of South Dallas. What's up, Ghetto Mayor? Ghetto Mayor of South Dallas. Turn your microphone on, sir. Yo, yo. What's up, brother? What up, Rick? Nah, I was just uh, letting you know. I had checked out the Good Times Jump. This, oh, God. I, I like that it had all the black people in there. You know, I want all my people to work. But, yeah, that's a lot of propaganda, my brother. <laughs> yeah, I could. You, you saw the whole. How many episodes you see? Oh, I mean, good. I'll mute your microphone. Go ahead. Yeah, all of them. Uh, team. So all of it? Yeah. Nigga, you sat through that? <laughs> yeah, I had to, man. I had to check it out. Dude, okay, you, you must have been smoking some high or something to get through that. You have yeah. to be high. Nah, you know, I, I was I was actually, um, I was, you know, I had caught um, um, walking pneumonia and shit, so I was just up, you know, getting better, checking it out. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of propaganda, man. I couldn't even. I was like, damn. I see why he felt how he felt. Real talk. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't do it. I, I, I did ten minutes. I couldn't. That's it. I could only do ten minutes of it. Damn, man. I've been on here for three damn hours, man. Okay, hell. Let me let me take my ass to bed. Shit. God, I've been on here for three hours. Let me get off here. All right, guys. I just saw how long I've been on here chopping it up with you guys. Hey, man. Let me get off here. It's been real. 
Um, go get your tickets to go see Microphone Check, the movie Microphone Check coming out next month. Microphonecheck.com. Um, support the rally for reparations that we're having June 15th. We need everybody's support to make it happen. Um, I'm going to have to put the GoFundMe on the website, but um, go to um, rally, the number four, reparations.com. And everybody get your root work deodorant at rootworkstyle.com. Rootworkstyle.com, ladies and gentlemen. Rootworkstyle.com. We got it. And also get the book Hidden Heroes from A to Z. We got a children's book that you guys got to get. Hidden Heroes from A to Z. HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. Hello, dear. How are you? Howdy. Yes, hi, my, uh, Lakeham Salam. How are you? How are you, ma'am? Hello. Hello, brother. Can you hear me? Dark I can machine. hear you, ma'am. How can I help you? Hello. Please follow me for a week. How can I help you, ma'am? Are y'all in there making some baklava? What are y'all doing in there? Unmute your microphone, ma'am. Or sir, I don't know what you are. You, you unmute your microphone. Oh, Lord. Okay. I tried to get one more good call, and they're in there making some hummus. All right, let me get out of here, because now the call is about to get crazy. Anyway, y'all, it's been real. It's been real, guys. Two years ago, we came here to Washington, D.C., shoulder to shoulder, with our voices raised in unison, demanding recognition, justice, and reparations. That moment was etched into the records of our struggle. And now, brothers and sisters, we are going to return here to Washington, D.C., not merely just to reminisce, but to reignite our spirit of determination, to amplify our voices, and to reaffirm our commitment to the cause. Join me, Tariq Nasheed, here in Washington, D.C., at the Rally for Reparations Juneteenth Celebration at Freedom Plaza. We're going to have a vast array of phenomenal speakers, guests, leaders, and activists who's going to reignite that spirit of Majawa that's within us and our lineage. You don't want to miss this event. Go to rallyforreparations.com. That's rallyforreparations.com. Come on down here to Washington, D.C. Be a part of history. Join me. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for justice. Stand up for your ancestors. Rallyforreparations.com. See you here.